All right, everyone. Uh, good evening. Yes. Welcome to Beyond Baroque. Uh, my name is Quentin Ring. I'm Beyond Baroque's executive director. I'm thrilled to, uh, to welcome you all to a reading here in our outdoor patio, a little COVID friendlier uh, than the theater. Um, but we, we have three of our favorite poets here tonight. Holiday Mason, Judith Pact, and Mariana Zaro. Um, yes. Um, before we get to that program, I would like to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by acknowledging Beyond Baroque's presence in the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and violent dispossession of their land. As an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting indigenous writers and communities. Um, Beyond Baroque is very much a space for poets and writers and artists. We've got writing workshops. Those include our free weekly Monday night fiction workshop, as well as our Wednesday night poetry workshop. We have regular master classes uh, that are held throughout the year. Um, upcoming, we have a workshop uh, on August 20th taught by Elizabeth Coyman. That workshop will be entirely in Spanish. Um, so really looking forward to that. If anybody Spanish speaker, please do sign up for that. Um, we also have a workshop coming up in September with uh, Judith Pact, who's here to read tonight on political poetry. Uh, tickets for that will be available shortly, I think within the week. So please do check our website about that. Um, we're also, uh, you know, have performances uh, readings and performances pretty much here uh, every week of the year will be a little quieter for the rest of August, but uh, tomorrow we do have Gabrielle Seville in performance. She is a poet, a memoirist, but also a very great performance artist. She's adapting her memoir, The Deja Vu, for performance. Uh, that will be in the theater as a multimedia um, sort of uh, show. So we're looking forward to that. Also, uh, tomorrow as well, we do have an art gallery. The current show is by our writer and poet in residence, Will Alexander, his collaborations with Byron Baker. The closing of that show is tomorrow. We'll be reading at 2 p.m. Uh, in the gallery. Even if you can't make that, please do check out the show uh, upstairs as well as in the lobby. It's fantastic. Uh, Will was just the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize uh, just last month. Um, we've got many other things here. We have an archive documenting the history of small press literature. Um, we also, and this is important, have a bookstore uh, where we have our poets books for sale after the show. So please do buy those, support, uh, support our poets, uh, support our bookstore. We very much appreciate it. Um, above all, of course, we do have a community of writers, poets, artists, uh, readers. Um, we depend very much on the support of that community. So if you're not a member of Beyond Baroque, uh, we'd love it if you would consider becoming one tonight. It costs as little as $50 for an individual membership, 75 is a dual membership. We have kept almost all of our events for free since reopening. Uh, and so we'd like to continue to do that. Your support very much helps us keep, uh, keep these programs free. Um, even if we do have to charge in your member, you will um, for the most part get in free to, to our events. So um, you can see, Eliza in the bookstore about becoming a member after the show. We appreciate it. Um, and um, yeah, so speaking of our community as well, I should really give a big thanks to our staff. A bunch of people helped on this program. Uh, Jimmy, Yvonne, Phoebe, Jay, Jessica, Emmanuel, Eric, uh, thank you all. Uh, you're all great. So um, let's go ahead and get to the reading. Um, it's a special event whenever we get to hear any of Holiday, Judith, uh, or Mariano. Um, to have them all here together, it just feels sort of like a powerhouse reading. So um, I think you're in for a treat. Um, I'll just, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start with Mariano and then we'll have Judith read and then Holiday. And so I'll start by introducing Mariano. Um, Mariano Zaro is the author of six books of poetry, including most recently, Decoding Sparrows, which we have for sale. Uh, he's a finalist of the Housatonic Book Award and Padre, uh, and which was the finalist for the Housatonic Book Award, uh, and is also author of Padre, Padre Tierra. His poems and short stories have been published in anthologies and literary journals in Spain, Mexico, and the United States. His translations include Buddha in Llamas by Tony Bonstone and Como Escribar Un Cancion de Mora. Apologize for my Spanish. Uh, he's a professor of Spanish at Rio Hondo Community College, um, and he is just a fantastic poet and person. So please welcome Mariana Zaro. Yeah.
thank you, Quentin. Uh, this is a very imposing audience. So um, I'm gonna read a few poems. All of them have a, a common thread. They borrow language from science. The first one is called Enzymes. And I never read this um, poem in public because it has very difficult words. So thank everybody for being here tonight. And thank you for suffering my mispronouncing. Enzymes. They are sitting at a table next to mine in a small restaurant in Madrid near Atocha station, father and daughter, I assume. Saliva contains enzymes that help catalyze chemical reactions in the body. She's eight, maybe 10, wears a summer dress, wide cotton with small printed lemons. The major enzymes in saliva are salivary amylase, salivary calicrane, and lingual lipase. I order a salad mineral water, something simple. I don't like eating alone. They order veal with mashed potatoes. Salivary amylase breaks down starches into a smaller, simpler sugars. When she drinks, the girl leaves her glass with both hands. The father is young, tells the waiter to bring a spoon, an extra napkin. Salivary calicrane increases vasodilation and capillary permeability. The girl has short hair, wears glasses fastened to the back of her head with a wide elastic band. Lingual lipase breaks down triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerides. The father chews a small piece of veal with his front teeth, picks it up with his fingers and gives it to her daughter in her mouth. The girl starts chewing, swallows, looks at her father, opens her mouth, smiles, gums swollen, grabs the spoon, clenches her fist. The spoon rattles against the plate for a moment. She eats the mashed potatoes on her own. The father rests both hands on the table. Saliva also contains lysozymes that kill bacteria, viruses, and other foreign agents in the body. The restaurant looks brighter now. Even the street traffic is gentler. I feel less alone. I may order a glass of wine after all to celebrate this girl, to celebrate her victory. Well, thank you. I'm not, um, I'm not an experimental poet, but sometimes I pretend. So I'm reading a couple of poems. <laughs> I am reading a couple of poems that are more experimental, a little bit. The first one uh, plays with fragments. You, you will still hear full sentences, but they are more fragmented. And this uh, poem is a tribute. Some poems are tribute. This is a tribute poem. Exoskeleton. Metal leg braces that extend, bend under the soles of his feet inside the boots, a crutch in the left hand. When he sleeps, the metal braces, the crutch also sleep. They sleep on the floor next to him, cold. The metal braces are cold when they sleep. I also sleep next to him, his shoulders, chest, arms are warm, his legs are not, never warm the legs. He tells me, don't forget to leave your armor on the floor tonight. He tells me, stay close. This, um, this next point you're gonna hear <clears throat> is a conversation, you're gonna hear one speaker 
speaking in English and the, the other speaker uh, in Spanish, the answers are in Spanish. I workshop this poem with a very famous poet and he didn't really care about it, but I'm very stubborn. So I'm trying this poem again with some changes. Let's see what happens. It's called The Weight of Sound. Sir, you know how this works. Just delete the last syllable of your words. Para seguir adelante, yes, to move on, you have to be lighter. Tan solo una sílaba, only one, yes, la última sílaba, the last syllable, that's right. For example, for example, camino becomes cami, libertad becomes liber, amatista, amatis, nadie me entenderá. They will understand. Millions of people are already done with the upgrade. Me da miedo el cambio, tanta pérdida. Change may be scary, but you don't lose much, few sounds here and there. Me da tristeza. It's not as sad as you think. You are shedding weight, remember? Algunas palabras tienen solo una sílaba. Of course. Some words only have one syllable. I am aware of that. Puedo decirlas por última vez. Yes, you can. Some of them. You can say them one last time before crossing. Adios, mar, sal, sol, luz, bien, mal, más, pez, pan, sí. Si, Ser, paz, tu, voz, no. Um, medication report. Could they have a straw, he asks. My hands are shaking. I get a straw from the counter at the 18th Street Cafe in Santa Monica. He looks small hunched over the table, spilled with iced tea. This tremor is the new medication, he says. I get it once a month now. I thought it was once a day, I say. That was methadone, he says. He still has long hair, tight in a ponytail. I walk to that methadone clinic every single day for years, he says. Now they have me on sublocate. What sublocate, I ask, is Subaxon, you know, he says, but it's not a pill, it's an injection. They poke you in the belly. Is this better for you, I ask? It's more convenient, he says, once a month, but I still have cravings. They are more like thoughts, fleeting thoughts. This is one more thing they try until they find something else to calm you down. They have to kill you a little, you know. He wears a black t-shirt and a flannel shirt unbuttoned. The shirt is too big, loose in the shoulders. Do you still play guitar, I ask. No, with these hands, he says, I can't. We met when you were in the school of music, I say. At UCLA, I played classical guitar and you also had a rock band, I say. Always between things, he says, never landing, didn't know where my heart was. Will you care for something to eat, I ask. Don't have much of an appetite, he says. Maybe we could share a bagel. That sounds good, I say. I knew where your heart was, he says. Yes, you did, I say. Sometimes the past feels so empty, he says. Sometimes so crowded. Do you think your hands will improve? The shaking, I mean, I ask. I don't know, he says. But I would love to play again, something to soothe this mind, even if just for a minute. Um, I'm gonna read two more poems. This is, um, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> this poem is a, a childhood memory. 
anatomy and color pencils. In the school library, I used to copy the illustrations of science books with tissue paper. You were not allowed to take these books home, but you could copy the illustrations if you were careful. I copied the illustrations of insects, most of all. First, I traced the perimeter. Insects have segmented bodies, jointed legs, and external skeletons. Then I traced the head, thorax, and abdomen, even the antennae and the coil proboscis. Butterflies have thin antennae with club-shaped tips. Moths have comb-like antennae, feathery. It was difficult to draw the inner organs, brain, heart, palpigian tubules. The average lifespan of a butterfly is usually one month. Some small butterflies only live one week. I like to collect the, the illustrations in the notebooks, bring them home into my room, each body dissected, labeled, organized, immutable. I tried to label my own body, to be my own insect, my own entomologist, but I could not stop the blood from rushing, the mind from wanting. And this is the last poem. Thank you, thank you everybody for being here tonight and for your very warm um, you know, acceptance of my poems. This poem, the last poem is, um, response to the diaries of the writer Patricia Highsmith. Reading the diaries of Patricia Highsmith. On July 26, 1967, Patricia Highsmith writes, my oldest snail died today. She says that the snail was born around late September 1964 and traveled from England to America and back, went to Paris five or six times to Mallorca and Tunisia. The snails appeared often in Highsmith's writings. In college, I read her short story, The Snail Watcher. I had forgotten it. The snail in her diaries broke back, broke back the story to me. Memory is magnetic. Memories attract each other. My father told me about the snails. They are hermaphrodites, but they still need each other, he said. I had to look up hermaphrodite in the dictionary and I didn't know what he meant with they still need each other. Why do snails have antennae, I asked my father. They are not antennae, they are tentacles. Their eyes are on the tip of each tentacle, you know, he said. The more you remember, the more you see. Snails can hibernate from long periods of time. They produce a white membrane like silk. It's called epiphram. They seal themselves. With memory, we travel in the spiral of time until we realize that the world we remember does not exist anymore. We can remember, but we cannot go back. My father placed an empty snail shell in the palm of my hand. It was almost transparent, so light, you could blow it away like a dry blade of grass. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. That was lovely. Next, we have Judith Pact. Uh, Judith's book, Summer Hunger, won the 2011 Penn Southwest Book Award for Poetry. Her recent poetry books include Infirmary for a Private Soul and a chapbook derived from haiku, a cumulus fiction. Pack was first place winner in the Georgia Poetry Society's Edgar Bowers competition. Her work appeared, appears nationally and internationally in journals and anthologies. In 2021, Verse Daily published her poem, Kin. Her poetry has been translated into Russian and published in the literary magazine, Foreign Literature. Pact reads at the Los Angeles Time Festival of Books at Charleston's Piccolo Spoleto Festival 
and has read and taught political poetry at Denver's annual Lit Fest at the Lighthouse. And as I mentioned before, we'll be teaching on the same subject here in September. Please everyone welcome Judith Pact. So good to see you all here. Thank you, Clinton, wherever you are. Getting easy there, there he is. And um, Clinton and Jimmy and the cast of characters who helped put this together. This, thank you, is that better? Yeah, yeah thanks very much. Um, I think you people have made Beyond Baroque what we always wanted it to be and you continue to, it's a big, Wonderful thing. I want to really, really. And thank you, Mariana, for that beautiful reading. I am just delighted to be reading with Mariano and Holiday at last. Holiday, I've talked about, we've talked about this for how many years? We're doing it now. Two poets that I really deeply admire. And one other word, I want to talk a little bit, very little about the um, archeology, span <laughs> yes, of poetry. It's history and the uncovering of treasures. And that means both form and, and poets on whom we all build our writing. So as it turns out, I looked over my poems for this evening, short poems, and um, they each one, not each one, but many of them do have that history. So, and the first one is, okay. Uh, I thank John Ashbury for his self-portrait in a convex mirror, um, but, but this, this goes in a different direction. Um, I'm gonna read you the note on this one which would normally be in a book at the end, but I think you'll want to know this. This is a quote. I say inner beauty doesn't exist. That's something that unpretty women invented to justify themselves. That was by Osmel Souza, who was the longtime head of Miss Venezuela pageant on the popularity of plastic surgery in Venezuela. On the other hand, this is portrait as a complex object. She has excised what some call excess, an ever so slight fat flap at the waist, a prominent nose, her pointed chin, pain plus time, her, <clears throat> her currency, her only leverage. It leaves her longing for something unseen, searching her deep reaches back in that dim corner where she privately turns over, arranges, rearranges her portrait, composing her real self from shattered redactions. An object, something like a decorated dish, warped in a mirror. She's looking for anything that might prove it must be there, her worth, just the thinnest slice. Depression Soup, 1936. The chicken feet at Sammy Yee's, a jumble. Grasses tuck slivered duck scallions in bowel clouds, orders sing out loud, vowels, trouble, clatter, roll and rattle, metal carts. Right here, mother ladles soup, pot to bowl, noodles tangle, mounds of ancient hen's feet, broth leached and leached, hours and hours from barely bubbling bones. Father's bald head, a brass globed finial, gleams tall over suit and tie. 
starched dinners. Mother's ordered breaths, her table set for dining with me, an animal whose procreant urges, primal, ravenous, suck jelly bits off Mount of Moon, Mount of Venus, my hands, their feet. And I just wanna to add to that in palmistry, which I don't know much about at all, Mount of Moon is an area at the base of the palm opposite the thumb, you can see, said to be the source of creativity, moods, and emotions. Mount of Venus opposite the Mount of Moon is said to be the source of energy, love, affection, and sympathy. <clears throat> All right, this is a uh, persona poem, which means, uh, uh, for those who don't know that, it's um, in, the, in the voice of someone else. In this case, it's an eight-year-old boy named Manny. This is sequitur, as in non sequitur, except that this is sequitur. Miss Apple's pale brown wig slowly climbs. Let me start again. <clears throat> Miss Apple's pale brown wig slowly crawls crab like toward her tiny bead black eyes. I arrange obedience on my face. The linoleum stinks. Our classroom workbooks open page 21. Low chairs in even lines face Miss Apple's tall desk and chair. Better to look up at her. I'm in the hall. A word storm bounces wall to wall through doors into other classrooms. My stomach flips and falls. Fear, a sharp edged shadow of indignant wind whistles darker worlds. Miss Apple's admonitory finger points left to right to left like mother's metronome. Late again, your unbuttoned shirt, your spelling score. Again, you jump to page. 42. Instead, I read. Instead, I read. Inuit mothers are chewing whale hide to soften for their baby moccasins. Somewhere, seals swim in deep cold bays. My neon tetra birthday fish swims safe at home in his tank. Tonight at supper, my father, his quiet voice. There was a part in that from Yeats, which might sound familiar from the second coming. The voice of the frog, and some of you who have been to my house years ago, Kathy, I know, and others have heard that frog. Yeah, and this, this, this reminded me of, of Elizabeth Bishop's In the Waiting Room. I don't mean that this poem is anything that good, but this, it has a part in it, which you will find the same. The Voice of the Frog. You have to start early. Listen hard. Stand in the doorway. Insistent, familiar, still hidden in lavender, his voice knows my footstep, or is it my shadow as I pass? I know him only by his rough call, just outside my door of windows. This water is mine. I do not know him really. He grows silent. Any strange change of light cuts the black air erases traffic, night jars, crickets. In the darkening, I cut the air with self-recrimination, recreation of what was said, unsaid, done, undone. 
but I'm not thinking. My voice is his. Our tandem talk is one voice. Both of us waiting for light, the consoler, light of the night before day. Thank you for that. Um, this is a meditation um, on conscience. I've done a, a whole series of conscience poems, one kind or another, small, intimate ones, and big world ones. This is a meditation on, on conscience uh, for Ken. Wrong an early imprint on the self. I should say these are three triolets, and so there'll be repetition. You'll hear a certain, yeah, I know some of you know what that is, but just heads up. Uh, meditation for conscience. Wrong, an early imprint on the self, dark and weighty, sullen as a stone that ducks and reappears as something else, as if to change that imprint of oneself. Something else must break through dark to yes, open doors, leave no and no alone. Instead here, yes and yes imprint itself. No longer weighty, sullen as a stone. What was it that I did when I was four or five? I pulled out ringlets strands of her red hair, those watery eyes, pale freckled skin. Besides, what did I know when I was four or five? Playing house just in the yard outside. She took away my doll, which wasn't fair. So I pulled out some strands of her red hair. There's more. I've stolen now and then. One time a peach, another time a word, an hour. Yes and no, sit far apart, withheld, allow, alive in silence speak. Still, thieving can be sweet. Think ripen peach, think open doors. The, boundly, the boundaries so oblique, one word, one hour rescues me from no. So stealing now and then a word, a peach, a slice of heart, which one? I never know. This is, this is my last poem. It is what is known as an Ars Poetica, which is a poem about um, a poem. I think that's my son. Hi, you made it, good. Well, he got off an airplane a few minutes ago. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is a poem about writing a poem. Untied. Scraps collected, saved and shaped to stanzas or laid out with care on paper like starched and ironed organza, crushed. Oh, those crumpled hours torn and tossed away. But something might be there. And then once when I was three, I tried to tie my shoe, hurled it flying fury against the flowered wall paper, making bruises of purple petaled flowers. Not so much later, I came to know the shoe's lace better. It's loop the loop, it's up round down. And then the lace and I became a bow. Thank you all so much. Thank you for coming and for listening. Wonderful, thank, thank you, Judith. Um, next up we have Holiday Mason. Uh, Holiday is the author of two chapbooks and five full-length collections, Towards the Forest and Dissolve, The Red Bowl of Fable and Poems, 
the She series of Ennis Correspondence with Sarah McClay, and The Weaver's Body. Nominated for three push cards, publications include Hotel Amer uh, America, Spillway, Solo, Pool, Poetry International, The Laurel Review, and more. She's also a portrait and fine art photographer focusing on the beauty of aging and humans as part of nature. Um, on Instagram, she can be found at holidaymasonphotography.com and her website is www.holidaymason.com as well. Please welcome Holiday Mason, everyone. Thank you so much. Hard acts to follow. <clears throat> well, um, I thought about thank yous and there are so many to thank that I could take the whole of my time naming names. And I don't think it would be a terrible thing to do. I think it would be a list poem. <laughs> I'm really grateful to so many people who care so much to be true. I think that's the way to put it. Thank you, Mariano and Judith. I love you both very much. Uh, thank you, the crew at Beyond Baroque. As Judith said so elegantly, it's a transformation that's um, holding space in such a world. I mean, you can hear the city rumbling around us, you know, and we're holding space. Um, I wanna just do really a quick shout out to some books that are coming this year and next. Uh, this year, Jan Wesley, look for her book. Uh, title, please. Well, her title is Only So Much, Sarah McClay. Nightfall, Marginalia. These are, these are gonna be fantastic books. Celeste Goyer has a new book coming next year called The Shoes of our guests, or my guests, our guests, the shoes of our guests, which is what poetry is. And um, someone who can't be here tonight, who's in Portland, who uh, many of us know, her name is Ash Good. And she has a collection coming this fall also. So she and Sarah Snow, she and Janie will be reading out, look for them. Um, and her title is Us Clumsy Gods. Yes, uh, I'm working on a new manuscript, so I'm only reading from that. I'm going to time myself because I can get uh, a bit overwhelmed. And you see the elegance of my companion's reading. Uh, you will find me slightly more chaotic. Um, the title of the manuscript is We Are a Long Time Dead, and it was given to me by Celeste Goyer, who, uh, but it's, it's really a Scottish proverb. And the, the proverb is be sure to live your life because you're a long time dead, right? And it's in three parts. And I'll read a tiny bit from maybe each part, maybe not. Um, <laughs> the collection has an erasure after each poem. So I'm going to start a stopwatch. And that's how I'm going to do this to keep myself managed a little bit. Okay. Uh, these are love poems. They go out to Adrian. A bedtime story. The body beneath me is a bellows, a train. The chamber of our violins strike the air, our limbs, a nexus of lightning. Bluffing the pillows into a street carnival, we travel from our old selves, carrying just the essentials. I open, he opens me more. The oil of laughter melts the webs around our eyes. It dampens our hair. It turns us more naked. We are so translucent, so huge. Should we be able to see so much? We hold just 
the essentials, our limbs more naked, I open a chamber of violins. We are a train of lightning. Laughter melts the webs. Ancient is always. Look how my hands are steady. No shake yet, no tremble. The day arriving reads the abacus. The days behind are pentimento. We are always almost old until we are in our personal imperfect homes of skin. The shared hydrangea bed where I count your vertebrae as if casting oracle runes, running my fingers over ancestral land masses of yarrow goldenrod where once you were a bearded god, a giant groundswell, my fighting companion with unassailable perfect teeth and baritone growls. But now my gait, slower with the black oak cane, ensures I won't bellow, won't win the always war, and neither will you, nobody does on your spine. I trace the patterns of the unmarred oceans with their own wind, their free and mythic weather. I protect this, our private play, this necessary music, brave, dense, electric, brightly humming. Thank you so much. We are imperfect in our homes of skin. My hands, a giant ground swell, steady in our shared land masses. I count, I run my hands over oracles, the day arriving, I protect this. This poem borrows a few lines from a group of poets I write with in Portland. Ashgood is a part of that group, so thank you, sisters. Summoned to perform at all hours of the night. It's so late, I can hear my grandmother Marjorie slap an ace high straight down on the linoleum light, a doral becomes smoke. We are so wet again, our pool hair swims across pillows. Is it fever or is it sex? The hum of a large horsefly scrolls illegibly on the ceiling. I re-enter sleep's elevator. It fills with ravens until the brass doors open and the gold foyer shatters with winds, wings as if to mock my inertia. Yes, it's far too costly to fly anywhere. So this summer we dream from our bed. The hourglass in my throat tells me time is running out. Grandmother stands mummified and naked, drinking red wine at the kitchen sink, shifting weight to relieve her bone spurs. She willed me her name, her cravings, her hunchback, goads me to love, glitter, and dirt. In equal measures, I light a candle, fix her silhouette, and it fix her in silhouettes that drip over my skin. You smell so good, even dead asleep, your eyes tumbling like newborns on the unborn under lids, crisscrossed with lilacs, rivers, the waters we come from, the waters we are. Marjorie, you call me and no one else ever has. This is how people make up other people in the dark. This summer we dream ravens. The hourglass in my throat tells me sleep's elevator fills with the waters we are. Marjorie, you call me. Silhouettes drip glitter over my skin. You smell so good. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. 
late sunlight like Monet. This might need a little context. It, it doesn't as itself, but um, because I shoot pictures, um, my beloved is an intrepid model and um, will follow me into the deep woods as I try to get a shot. So late sunlight like Monet, searching for gilded snow melt ponds shrouded in the woods we decipher our way over decaying stormfall hidden in dense lodgepole pines sliced with sunset there are so many sides of things and fire on the sea behind us on the cries of gold spiraling up drafts fire too in clouds as if clouds could burn all harsh words ever spoken. Yours or mine, those we've left behind. Now it's not selfish to push, to mount sundown, strip beside you and enter the opal water, cast in liquid gold, perfect, remorseless, the past complete, our hands utterly empty as lily pads, pale blossoms float like everyone's secret wishes and dragonflies sip from the night pond, nearly kissing our open eyes as we watch from under the surface, the arrival of new stars. There are so many sides of things. Clouds burn behind us. It's not selfish to want to be beside you, perfect remorseless, our hands empty as we decipher our way under the surface sliced with sunset. Talking to ashes. The ashes are gold, so it must be tomorrow under a tree full of dream catchers. The drought cracked oaks in Topanga, Oregon suffocated in smoke, hydrangeas and birches burn. The trees are like Christ's, uncorrupted in union and in communion, interspecies, carbon fed with sunlight, they give birth to violins. While four chainsaws tear the tall eucalyptus across the street to rags, my index and ring finger bend over my thumb like a mother protecting a babe, a jester which was my mother's. The last of the family line, I carry the horned spine of the grandmother's bundle, so live in both under and over worlds where signals travel from root to root, netting the globe. Debris flies like grasshoppers, sawdust coats the sunlight like marigold blooms, covering the graves on the day of the dead where destiny candles shimmer signals back and forth between all the departed. So I ask them to remember me, show me the way when I too return to the entrance. All the departed carry the cracked oaks, the birches, the grandmother's bundles. Netting the globes, trees give birth uncorrupted. Signals travel back and forth to the entrance. They are gold, so it must be tomorrow. And let's see if I can find now what I want to do. Um, this is a really crazy read, so we'll see. The poem is called Pul Pulchritude and it goes out to Christian Celeste. Beautiful. She uses the word pulchritude and I can't recall what it means. Me, a poet near 59. That was a while ago. 
me a poet near 59 and I have to ask and I do is the man next door drags the garbage cans to the curb while the small town rises to Sunday the fallen blooms of the late magnolias lining the trees filling now with September students bound for winter yet clinging hard to summer I watch them while she explains the word, the nature of arcane treasures, of cleavage, sparked allure, gold tan skin or white, ebony or brown, young women in tube tops and cutoffs, halters, bikinis, hip huggers, sashaying P-I-N-K across the ass, flashing the final inch of butts and thighs, the rules of young muscles rippling fierce with aromas of dark must, musk, drive, diving in, drowning in the hidden temple, a rose tattoo at the gateway like a sentinel, pulchritude, comeliness, pulp and pulse, plunge of round, floodful, straining cloth, tight over, unbreakable, pliant, yielding, smooth, supple, forbidden, fortune, cookies of sheen, lip gloss, polish, lip glitter, moist skin on all sweaty curves, plump hallways of animal, cohesion, succulent, wellsprings, of molding the shapes of this world to gauze and silk to elastic scarlet wobble of spanx, mesh, mash, satin, rich form, itching the hands of the humans, craving to stroke, hold, grasp, flow with the choirs, the bottoms, breasts, tummies, the inescape, inescapable weather of nude shoulders, lustrous, lusterous secrets, rippled, kneaded, molded these bowls of bones pummeled into dreamscapes of a lasting flesh heaven the clay of our bodies the stuffed sheaths dizzying enchantments of the long brown black red blonde hairs the shaven creamy sheerness the tawny silk loved all globes of sugar loved tree sap or unspoken guttural operatic howls loved annunciation loved corridors of desire baskets and tables of flesh of femme of cock loved of babies and union oh pulchritude the last supper the reason for black dresses and lace undies for prayers and food sirens siren spirals of of rapture, young bodies all over the place, perfumed and everywhere, promenading the main drag of Sunday before they all fly away like seed pods. I want to read one more poem, if I can even find it. And I want to thank you all. I, I truly love you. And um, come out for the people you come out for these books. They're coming. They're they're fantastic books. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, my last poem is called Lizards, <laughs> and I'll read the erasure also right after. Then we can drink wine. Yeah. Okay. Lizards, you're all the beautiful boys of my youth, lying like lizards on the granite grottoes warm and tan, the boys I never fucked, too pink and plump to be what they desired. You're the kiss on wet lips, honey crisp, not melancholy. So yes, I leapt over my dread in my worn out shoes, still good enough to go. You're not afraid of the charnel grounds in the cottonwood grove, crumbled with drought, scarlet foxgloves bent and thirsty, where I scattered my dead, danced nude on their graves, as a fisherman came to the shore in the mist, threw out his line and never even saw me. But you see, and we listen, as birds talk to trees who talk to the wolves who return the skeletal debris of our failures to, the, to our own feet so we can say goodbye with due respect. You're all the beautiful boys of my youth, supple, easy, loose muscled after swimming the rapids and I composed, 
dress in red apples from a farm that was once raised by ice, R-A-Z-E-D, that was once raised by ice, bringing you the fruit of stars exploded a million years ago. You're all the beautiful boys. You're I gone over dread. You're swimming the rapids. You're never fucked too pink. You're scattering my dead. You're still good enough to go. You're composed and dressed from a farm. Your wet lips, not melancholy. You are nude in the mist. You're the fruit of stars exploded. You're all the beautiful boys. You're all the beautiful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mariano. Beautiful reading. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Another round of applause for Holiday and for Mariano and Judith as well. Yeah. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, as Holiday mentioned, we have some wine, some fruits and cheese. Please feel free to hang out. We'll try and clear a little more space for everybody. We also, of course, have books for sale in the bookstore. So feel free to hang out and have a little bit of a conversation. Thank you. Great.